Hey everybody, thanks again for listening to the Zim Geek channel. I was talking to an old friend of mine the other day, and he asked me, Hey, what do you think of that Captain Marvel? And I asked him, which one? And he said, well, you know, the one that's got the movie coming out. And I asked, okay, which one? Captain Marvel is a name that's synonymous with the comic industry. There has usually always been, in one form or another, a Captain Marvel out there. The problem is, is that there's been quite a few. But the good thing is, is that if you go back and you look at the history, the all the way back through all of the many different Captain Marvels, it's such a wonderful, perfect example of what makes up this comic book industry. And believe me when I tell you, it ain't pretty. So I thought I would take a couple of videos here and talk about the history of Captain Marvels. All of the different Captain Marvels, at least the ones that I'm aware of, and their history. And I think not only will you be entertained, but you'll be astonished at some of the information that I have to tell you. In this first video, I want to cover the history of the original, original Captain Marvel. Captain Thunder, to start with, and everyone now knows of him as Shazam. Captain Marvel debuted in Wiz Comics in 1939, December, created by Bill Parker and C.C. Beck. And the similarities to Superman are undeniable, though the origin of the character didn't start out like that. Writer Bill Parker had originally wanted to have Captain Marvel as the leader, or at least have an entire group of superheroes, each one patterned after a specific attribute from a hero in old mythology. His bosses weren't really interested in a group of superheroes. They were interested in a single character, maybe something exactly like Superman. Superman had premiered a few months earlier in Action Comics, and it had caught on like wildfire. So the Fawcett bosses really wanted to catch that lightning in a bottle. The popularity of Superman, in fact, exploded the comic market to the point where there was already infighting going on. A lot of arguments, a lot of backstabbing, a lot of craziness. In fact, Fawcett had to prepare ash cans really quick in order to try to secure copyrights on their ideas. That's the same thing as what we would call an ash can today, a bunch of 8.5 by 11 sheets of paper printed in black and white and saddle stitched in the middle. They did that in order to secure copyright, and they had a really rough time when they first started trying to secure copyrights on different titles. For example, they were going to premiere their character in an anthology comic. Anthologies were the thing back then, because again, these comics started as collections of comic strips. So they tried ash cans on Flash at comics and Thrill comics, only to find out that they were too close to other comics. There was already a Flash comics, there was already a Thrill comics coming out. They were originally going to call their character Captain Thunder, but there was a problem with that too. Some say with a character from DC called Johnny Thunder. So instead, they ended up settling on the name Captain Marvelous that they shortened down to Captain Marvel. And some people say that that was even a little jab at another anthology book that had started that was also pretty popular called Marvel Comics. They wanted to trade in on Superman's success, but they also wanted to go one step further. Instead of a grown man changing clothes and becoming a superhero, they had a young boy who magically said a magic word, Shazam, and turned into a superhero. Bill's idea was to use a youngster in order for younger readers to be more associated with the character. That really changed the entire atmosphere of the strip and made it a lot more lighthearted, a lot more fantasy-oriented. Then they brought in artist C.C. Beck from their Pulp Magazine division. He had been illustrating Pulp Magazines for a while and had never really done sequential art before. But he took to the job and really made it his own. He went through and simplified his style down, making his work as open and fun and simple sometimes as the stories he was telling. And really, why not? At the time, they were being paid by the page. So the more completed pages you turned in, the more money you got. So of course, you're going to pare everything down, leave it as open as possible, because it's a funny book, and you want the bright colors to come through. So there's less definition on the character. There's a lot more fanciful, more cartoony aspects going on. And yet, even though it was incredibly simplified, there was a key element that C.C. would not sacrifice in his work, and that was quality. 
all of these stories, all of the work that CC did had a level of quality to them that made his style incredibly unique and incredibly accessible. And on a side note here, Captain Marvel had become so popular, he was in multiple places, multiple months. And obviously, CC couldn't do all the work, but his studio and himself oversaw all of these other artists working on that strip, so it all had a unified look, almost like the first real house style. Slowly but surely, the sales on this book kept rising. Uh, originally premiered in uh, Wiz Comics, soon Captain Marvel had his own Captain Marvel adventures that very quickly ended up going bi-weekly. That meant it came out twice a month. Its popularity continued to escalate, and it didn't take long before a few other people started noticing as well. National Comics, the owners of Superman, had lightning in a bottle when it came to their creation, Superman in Action Comics. They had already defended the character before when another company uh, created Wonder Comics. Actually, it was Will Eisner, the creator of The Spirit, that did that and had Wonder Man. They quickly shut that product down. But when Captain Marvel showed up, they sent Fawcett a cease and desist, but they quickly ignored it and kept producing Captain Marvel anyway. The owners of Superman finally filed their lawsuit officially when they found out that Captain Marvel had become a Republic serial. Now, these serials were little short chapter plays that were done in the theater. This was long before television, and they were little 20-minute segments. But actually, Captain Marvel was the first superhero ever to be filmed live action for the mass market. And this really drove the owners of Superman crazy. Fawcett kept uh, National Comics busy in litigation all the way through the Second World War. All this time, Captain Marvel kept gaining in popularity and, frankly, kept generating a lot of cash. The uh, actual trial didn't start until 1948. Then, it was kicked on a copyright glitch on the part of National. It was appealed, and it, the decision was overturned, and it looked like the case was going to go back to court. That first trial had lasted quite a few years, and there was a lot of bantering back and forth, a lot of examples thrown of characters performing feats before or after certain dates. It really got to be quite a confusing mess. By the time it was up for appeal, it was 1952, and comics by that time, the sales on comics had started really dropping because after the war, Comics had a hard time sticking around and then got branded as juvenile delinquency literature. And I talked all about that back in my ninth video, if you want to go back and check that out. In the end, Fawcett uh, really kind of gave up the ghost and settled out of court with DC with an agreement that they would stop printing Captain Marvel. Or they were thinking about getting out of the comic book business altogether anyway, and they gave... National Comics, the compensation of around $400,000. That probably just barely covered their legal expenses. In the meantime, between Captain Marvel's creation and their decision not to publish comics anymore, Fawcett Publications made a ton of cash off of Captain Marvel. Because it wasn't just Captain Marvel. They did every marketing trick that you could imagine in order to keep the sales up and to pump the readership and to make uh, a semblance of change and additions to the Captain Marvel family. In fact, they even had a comic called The Marvel Family for quite a while. They also added Captain Marvel Jr., Mary Marvel. There were three Lieutenant Marvels. Just about anybody who uh, had the name Billy Batson could use the word and turn into a Marvel character. Most notably here was Uncle Marvel, who was a shyster guy, very much like the Wizard in The Wizard of Oz, who decided that if he dressed up in a costume or changed clothes when nobody was looking and told everybody that he was uh, Captain Marvel or he was a Marvel, that he would get uh, the same treatment that Captain Marvel and all the Marvel family got. Another great character was a talking tiger, and having talking animals in the strip was not unusual, as uh, they also had a villain who was a talking alligator, and another one that was a talking tomato worm, who was uh, quite the evil genius. 
He was probably an alien, but the main arch villain for Captain Marvel was this bald, mad scientist guy called Dr. Savannah. And Savannah had two kids also. Uh, so there was an entire Savannah family that was fighting the whole Marvel family uh, over and over and over again. Now, the charm and the marketing and the effort that Fawcett put through in order to promote these characters turned Captain Marvel into the highest-selling superhero probably of all time. As Captain Marvel Adventures, that book I mentioned earlier that was being published once every other week, actually obtained steady sales in the 1.3 to 1.4 million copy range. For a few years there, this wasn't just a powerhouse comic property, it was THE powerhouse comic property. And that, I'm sure, sent National and the owners of Superman straight into a tizzy. In fact, it wasn't long after the appearance of Dr. Savannah showing up in the strip that DC gave Superman an arch villain who was also a bald, mad scientist named Lex Luthor. Luther initially started out as, with a head of bushy red hair, but he quickly shaved it, amazingly probably to look more like Dr. Savannah. Then there was Captain Marvel Jr., who was extremely popular on his own. In fact, rumor has it that Elvis patterned his show costume, especially the one with the big flowing cape, off of Captain Marvel Jr.'s cape, saying that he wanted to be a superhero whenever he was out on stage. Where Captain Marvel's adventures was simplified and uh, with C.C. Beck's wonderful uh, minimalistic artwork, Captain Marvel Jr. was almost exactly the opposite with artwork by Mac Raboy with really beautiful inking and fine detail. It was really an amazing strip. Captain Marvel Jr. made his first appearance in Wiz Comics number 25, which was cover dated December 1941. It's probably being worked on about August, September, right around the time that National filed lawsuit against Fawcett for the creation of Captain Marvel. Also, amazingly, four years after that came the appearance of Superboy, which was almost like a version of Captain Marvel Jr. in and of itself. A year after Captain Marvel Jr. showed up, Mary Marvel showed up in uh, Captain Marvel Adventures number 18. That was cover dated December of 1942. Though I'm not sure what kind of influence that had on the creation of Supergirl, she came out years later in August of 1958. The trial itself generated a lot of negative publicity, and this at a time when comics were branded as juvenile delinquency material, so it really didn't help either company or either company's sales. What I do find interesting is after Captain Marvel stopped and ceased publication, DC didn't gain any type of control over that copyright. They just let it sit. Plus, the feel, the fanciful uh, air that Captain Marvel had, what I like to call satirical whimsy, really ended up showing up in all of the other DC comics, especially once the Comic Code Authority kicked in and they decided that they had to be kids' literature. It's almost like they used the Captain Marvel stories as a template of how their stories need to be now, now that they've got these Comic Code restrictions. Now, National lost their first trial after years, it had it tossed because of a copyright glitch. So it really astounds me that they didn't go after and secure that copyright from Fawcett. In fact, when they decided to rebirth Captain Marvel again back in the early 70s, they went back to Fawcett and actually licensed the rights for the character. So they were still paying Fawcett every time Captain Marvel made an appearance in their comics until they ended up buying the property outright in 1992. But by 1992, it was kind of too late to secure the name Captain Marvel. And we'll have to cover that one in the next video about the history of the Captain Marvels. Here comes a can of worms, folks. And again, I just want to point out to you that this wasn't just some flash-in-the-pan character. This was a huge powerhouse character. The biggest printed character of all time. The first character to be filmed in live action. In fact, his comic went on for years and years. Wiz Comics, where Captain Marvel first appeared in, ran for 155 issues. Captain Marvel Adventures ran for 150 
not to mention Master Comics that had Captain Marvel Jr. in it, ran for 133 issues. Captain Marvel Jr. itself ran for 118 issues. Mary Marvel ran for only 28 issues, but WoW Comics that she was in ran for 69 issues. And Marvel Family, where they were all together, ran for 89 issues. There was even a funny animal parody of Captain Marvel during this period called Hoppy the Marvel Bunny. And he was also very successful running in funny animal comics and he had his own title for 15 issues. I could have easily gone on twice as long talking about the original Captain Marvel. And if you ever get a chance to dig up some of those old C.C. Beck stories, please do it and give them a read and keep in mind the time period that they were done in. DC recently squashed a reprint volume that they were going to do about Captain Marvel's longest-running serial, The Monster Society of Evil, which uh, really featured that little tomato worm that I was talking about, Mr. Mind. They were worried that some of the stories, some of the characters inside that long-running story would be taken wrong because they were based on stereotypes of the day. In my opinion, they bypassed an ideal opportunity to put some incredible sequential art in historical context. And yet again, give the shaft to a property that they never really respected in the first place. But we'll get into more of that with the next part of the history of the Captain Marvels. That's it for this one. I really have to stop before stuff really gets crazy. Because after that court battle, once Captain Marvel goes quiet, Everything starts breaking loose, and you won't believe what ends up happening. Hope you stay tuned. Hope you catch the next video. My next video, number 12, is going to be a cartoon instructional. But number 13, we're going to pick this right back up, right when it starts getting crazy. So I hope you're going to stick with me for that one. So if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button below, leave a comment in the comment section, and subscribe to my channel. Plus, tell your friends. There's a lot of fun happening here, and the more encouragement I get, the faster I'm probably going to kick these out. So, till next time, I appreciate each and every one of you. Thanks a lot, and thanks again for being here.